So, this is lesson 14. And the title is going to be Riemann Conformal Mapping Theory. So the objective of this lesson is to state and prove the celebrated result in, in, in complex analysis, who, which roughly states that any uh, open, con any simply connected open sets of, of the complex plane different from the whole complex plane is be holomorphic to the unit disk. Okay. So. In fact, all uh, as we have said in another lectures, and uh, all the um, simply connected open sets are essentially either the Riemann sphere if it is compact, okay, either the whole complex plane, or if not, it is holomorphically equivalent to the unit disk. There are no more. Hmm? Okay, and uh, what we, we use. We, we will use as a, let's say as a, a property of um, simply connected open sets the fact that the that the following fact assume you have a set u simply connected you have a holomorphic function on u that has no zeros does not vanish anywhere then there exists a square root Holomorphic square root is the only property we will use about the simply connected open set. So, in fact, we will show that we can call this property the square root property. So, we will show that if you have an, an open set with the square root property, is by holomorphically equivalent to the unit disk. In fact, if this set is different from C, because C, of course, has the square root property also. Okay. So, the first result, the first. Uh, we will begin by showing a proposition. So let us begin with, the, as I told you before, with an open set U having this property and different from C. Self. Different from C, this is important. So, proposition there exists an injective map. There exists F of U to the open disk injective. Holomorphic and injective. So first of all, we will prove the injectivity. The injectivity. So there exists at least one injective map. Okay. In order to show it, so proof of that. Proof. In fact, the result is not going to be very complicated uh, uh, with all the things we have. We already have the proof of that. Take a point who, that is not in you. So here we are, going, we are using that u is not c. Take a point a, not in u, and consider the function z minus a. Z minus a is a function, a holomorphic function on u, that's, who, that, which that not, does not vanish on u. So it has a square root, this function. So there exists. Function like this it has a square root. Some properties of this function. First of all, uh, h is injective. Well, this is quite clear. If h one of z uh, is h of z one is equal to h of z two, take the square of the squares of these two terms, and you have that z one. So z1 is equal to z2. So h uh, is of course injective. Second, zero does not belong to the image of h. Okay, if h1 z is zero, 
take the square and z minus a is zero. So z must be equal to a, but a was not a point in u. So zero is not in the image of a. Third, it's u and minus, minus h u are disjoint open, disjoint sets. Why are they disjoint? Okay, assume that the point belongs to both. So hz1 is minus hz2 with z1 and z2 points on u. Take the square and if you take the square you have, uh, you eliminate, you remove the minus sign here and you have that, the okay, so z1 must be equal to z2 which could imply that this number is zero, but zero is not in the image. Okay, so these are disjoint open sets. Okay, and finally, remember the open mapping theorem. So these are um, these are uh, open sets because the image of a holomorphic function, an open set, is itself an open set. So here, this set here is open. So take a disk in minus h u. Consider some disk. Uh, let's say. Uh, here, and this contained in minus h of u. Okay, and the function, um, well, this disk is contained here, so this disk uh, has empty intersection with h of u. As empty intersection with each of you. So consider now the function f of z, 1 over h of z minus omega. h of z minus omega as h of u uh, does not intersect this disk, h of z minus omega is in modulus greater or equal than r. So this is in modulus or it is smaller or equal than 1 over r, 1 over r. So this is bounded, in fact, this function. So f is injective, defined on u, and bounded. Okay, now you only have to take r, r, f of z, something like this, or perhaps something smaller than r, r prime, r of f of z, r prime, take any r prime is more than r and this is a function from u to the disk uh, injective injective function injective holomorphic function from u to the disk okay so there exists at least injective functions from any such set u to the unit disk the objective is to find one of these functions which is not only injective but bijective and uh, more or less we are done in this case, this is a biholomorphism. Okay, so this is the first part of the result. Okay, so now we go to the proof of Riemann's, uh, Riemann's theorem. We go to the proof of Riemann's theorem. So consider an open set U, different from C. And we're going to show that u, uh, with the square root property, u with the square root property, we're going to show that u um, is biholomorphically equivalent to the unit disk. Okay, so take a point, uh, take a point for instance, uh, well, there exists, you know that there exists at least one u from the disk uh, injective. At least there exists one. Okay? Uh, take, call it f0, some, some injective function. Okay, now consider the, the family of function, the following family of function. Take, an, take a point in u, an arbitrary point in u, and consider the following family. Consider the families of function, let's say f of u to d holomorphic, injective, and such that f prime of z0 
is greater or equal than f0 prime of z0. Where f0 is your the preceding function. Okay? Consider this family. This is a non-empty family. As f0, of course, belongs to f. So this is non-empty. And this is a relatively compact family using Montel's theory. Why? Uh, all fun functions here are bounded because they are function, the target of the functions is D. So uh, they are bounded in every compact. So it is using uh, Montel's theorem. This is a relatively compact, uh, a relatively compact family. And in fact, it is compact because if you take any sequence of functions in F, which converges to a certain function f, so converges to a certain function f, first of all, you have this uh, inequality here. You have that fn of z0. This must be greater. And if it converges, it converges, uh, if it converges uniformly in compact, the derivative converges in uniformly incompact, so in particular the derivative converges in the point z0, so f prime z0 must be also and the fact that f0 is injective warranties that this derivative is not zero. This is going to play some role. If it, the derivative was zero, the, the function could not be injective. You can use the open mapping theorem, for instance, if the mapping is, if, if a function is injective, uh, or you can use that the fact that if the point that the derivative is zero, you have, um, for instance, if the value of the z zero would be zero, you would have a zero of greater order greater than one. And in this case, there are several points going to this point. So the, map, the mapping could not be injective. Okay, so this must be strictly positive, in fact. So, okay, and moreover, you have fn a sequence of functions here, a sequence of sequence of injective functions, a sequence of injective functions in a domain. The limit, you know, is itself either injective or a constant, but it cannot be a constant because of that. But because at least in one point the derivative is not zero. So it cannot be a constant, the limit. So f is injective. The limit is injective. So f belongs to f. It verifies these properties, it is holomorphic, and it is injective. So f is compact. Okay. So you have a non-empty compact set. Now let us consider the following map from this compact set to R. Take fun any function f and evaluate in f in z0 the derivative. The derivative, I think, yes. And yes, and take the modulus here. Okay, this is a continuous map. It's quite easy to see this continuous, and this is compact. So the image of a continuous map. Uh, of a compact by a continuous map must be a compact set, so in particular it must have a maximum. By Bayes' theorem, it map has a maximum. So there exists f uh, g. I'm going to call it g using the notation I have in my notes. If not, I'm going to get lost at some moment. There exists a g, a function g in f, okay, such that uh, g prime over z0 is maximum. So g prime over z0 is greater or equal than f prime of z0 for every f. So in particular g is injective. So we take a maximum. g is injective. Okay. So g is a map, a, a holomorphic and injective map from u to d. Holomorphic and injective. Assume um, is not bijective. Assume is not bijective.
So there exists A in the open disk D and not in G of U. Let us consider now the following Mebius transformation that we have already used. The Mebius transformation phi A, you remember, was Z minus A, 1 minus A bar conjugate of R, Z. This is a Mebius transformation, a biholomorphism of the unit disk taking A to 0. So you can now take this composition. This composition has not zeros on you. So you have taken the point uh, A, uh, you have moved it, and now you know this point A is zero. So this, this has not zeros on you. So you have a function, holomorphic function on you, which has not no zeros. Using the square root property, this function is the square root on another function. Uh, the, no, the square root, I mean, is the square uh, of another function, okay? So there exists some function h, where h is a function from u to d, okay? h is a function from u to d. Now, h of z0, uh, h of z0 has some value, b, has some value b, okay? Take phi of b and uh, consider now the function f of z equal to uh, phi b times h, okay? Phi b, the function here. So f of z0 is now going to 0. Consider all this, consider, uh, all these functions here. And now you can write, no. now you can write that G is uh, the inverse of phi A, it was phi minus A, H to the square here. And H is uh, phi minus B times, uh, composed by F in this order, so And you can verify easily that this is, in fact, the same that this here. Okay, you can verify easily this, this equality. Okay, you have written G like this. So G prime of Z0 now, using chain rule, is F prime of Z0. f prime of z0 uh, times f0, uh, f of z0 goes to 0, times the derivative of this function at 0. Okay, uh, sorry, uh, put, sorry, there is a mistake. There is a mistake, sorry. The square was here, is here. Okay, so uh, you can verify this equality. You have this product here. Okay. Okay, but uh, this function here, this function here, phi minus a composed phi minus b to the square is a function from the disk to the disk, function from the disk to the disk, and it is not injective, not injective, because we have a square here, for instance, it's not injective, so in particular it's not uh, Okay, uh, you remember that we had some bounds for uh, any function uh, from the mm, disk to itself. We have found some bounds on the on the derivative. So, in fact, we know you know that the derivative of this function at zero, we had proven that it was less or equal. In fact, that one in this case minus. Uh, the image at zero. Well, in fact, you remember uh, you, you, when you have some, fun, some function here such that a goes to b, we had proven that h prime of a 
was smaller than 1 over b squared, 1 minus, 1 minus b squared, 1 minus a squared, something like this. Okay, uh, so in this case we have, this is smaller, but this number, the denominator would be 1, and the quality only hold it when, uh, in fact, applying a Schwarz lemma, the function might be a, a nomotesis. And this is not the case, it's not a nomotesis. So, equality does not hold, in fact, here. So, we can remove the less or equal. In fact, it's a, a strictly a strict inequality. So, uh, applying this inequality here, this is strictly smaller than 1. So, applying this inequality here, you know that it's a strictly smaller than f prime z0. And this is a contradiction. Why is this a contradiction? Because we had chosen j somewhere, perhaps I already wrote that. We have chosen j in such a, uh, no, j, okay, we have chosen j over there, such that the value at z0 was maximum. And we have found another function in the same condition, such that the value is maximum. You can verify that f uh, verify so f of course is injective by the way we have constructed uh, so we are done we have arrived to the contradiction and uh, and we are done in this case okay so we have proven this uh, Riemann conformal ramping theorem of course this is an, a non-constructive proof this only shows that such a map exists it's not easy it's not always easy to uh, construct, uh, let's say, precisely a map from uh, some set to uh, holomorphic, by holomorphic map, an explicit by holomorphic map from subset to some, some set to, uh, to an open disk. But there exist some uh, ways of uh, doing. For instance, it's not complicated to do it for a strip, for an angle, let's say, for uh, there are many lists, even the ta tables of uh, possible conformal mappings from several kinds of sets to uh, to the unit disks. Sets like, like for instance, wedges like these or strips, etc., or even some more complicated domains. And in fact, there is a procedure to construct uh, effectively this map from any polynomial, uh, any any polygon, any polygon. Sorry, any polygon. You take any polygon like this, and you can construct uh, pre, um, uh, explicitly a map from here to the unit uh, disk. In fact, this is what is called Schwarz-Christoffel theorem. Schwarz-Christoffel's formula. More or less the idea of this formula is to construct a map from the upper half plane to the polynomial. And the idea essentially is the following. You take the vertices of the polynomial, of the polygon, sorry. Uh, I, I'm not, I don't know what I, why I'm saying polynomial instead of polygon. Of the polygon, you take the vertices, and you take here some points, one point for each vertex. Let's say, if you, as if you straight the, your polygon like this. And, okay, for instance, if you want this point you want go, you want it to go to this vertex. Okay, you only, you have to move a little bit the angles. And how do you move the angles? Essentially, uh, you have a point here, uh, omega i. You must find the map something like this: z minus omega i times to some power alpha i. Taking some alpha i conveniently, you can. Uh, modify the angle here. So you modify the angle such that you have exactly this angle here. This angle here. And you do it in, the, in all the points. So you take a, some product. Like this. 
This product is well defined in the upper half plane, and you have to do many computations there after to uh, modify a little bit to be sure that it uh, goes inside the polygon, etc. But the first steps are like this. But the important thing is you can explicitly construct a map from any um, well, in this case it's from a polygon from the upper half plane to any polygon. If you want to construct it from a disk, of course you know that uh, there is an explicit map, an explicit by holomorphism from the disk to the upper half plane. Uh, we construct it in the opposite sense. There are uh, some lessons before, but um, uh, this map is well known. So, for some sets, it's quite uh, easy. You can write it explicitly, okay? But not in general, of course, not in general. So some complements to this result. Mm, well, can I yes. Uh, by sending a polynomial, there will be uh, there will be uh, another point which goes to corners of the polygon. Polygon. So if there is a change about to this, or it's it does not depend on the what you choose it. Of, of what? That doesn't depend on. You say that you are sending it with the point of right. Yes, you change, you choose some points here, any points in the same order as the vertices of the polygon, polygon, and you try to send these points to uh, modify a little bit that uh, this expression to try to send each of these points to one point in the polygon. Yes, to one vertex in the polygon, and uh, you try that uh, this segment goes to. The side of a poly, so you you need uh, uh, no not this side this side here. Okay, if you want that this point goes to this vertex and this point want, goes to this vertex, you need also that this uh, segment goes to this edge here, and uh, you have to work a little bit. Finally, you know that all the uh, real line goes to the edge of the polygon. And you can be sure you, you need to be sure that the upper half plane goes to the interior and it is bijective, etc. It's not so it's, it's much more complicated, in fact. But more or less is that the idea. Uh, it's the idea of the proof, uh, of the construction. But the the interest of that is that it can be constructive explicitly, if you need, for any polygon you have. Okay? Of course, you have to move a little bit that. It's not, it's not exactly this function, of course. You have to move a little bit. But the function, the construction begins here. It begins like this. Okay. More or less the idea. Okay, some compliments on this result. Of course, the map we have constructed is not unique at all. There is a map from U, a bihormorphic map from U to D, that is not unique at all. Why? Of course, <clears throat> it's not unique because if you have uh, one map, one by holomorphic map from U to D, and you compose here with any uh, by holomorphic map from U to D, that you know there are many, okay? You know how they are, in fact, you have another one, okay? So, in fact, if you have two maps here, f and g, uh, if you take, uh, let's say, f minus 1 composed by j, this is a map from d to d, by holomorphic, and you know how it is. You know that this one must be something like lambda phi a, phi a, or phi a, some of the functions like this, um, uh, maybe transformation like this, a lambda some uh, number of modulus one. Okay, so you know how all the maps can be constructed if you know one of them. Uh, but some complements, for instance, assume you have two maps. Assume you have f and g, two maps from u to d, two by holomorphism from u to d, having the same value in one point. Having the same value zero going to zero in this point in one point, there is a point that they go to zero, and the same derivative. In 
the same derivative in one point. Okay? So take now uh, G. From D to D, this map G, uh, F minus 1, takes 0 to 0. Okay? Takes 0 to 0. And so applying uh, uh, it is a biholomorphism. A map uh, from D to D that takes 0 to 0 and is a biholomorphism is necessarily lambda set, where lambda some complex number of modulus 1. So, g of z must necessarily be lambda f of z. And now you apply that you know that the derivative at z0 is the same. So, g of z. If these numbers are the same, lambda is equal to 1. These numbers are the same, lambda is equal to 1, so g is equal to f. So if they coincide in a point that goes to zero, both the function and the derivatives, uh, the function are, are equal. In fact, you even don't need uh, in this last uh, computation here that the derivatives agree. Even if you know that the derivatives have the same argument, so the value of the derivatives, in principle, you only assume that they are in the same half line from the origin. Uh, as you know, that lambda is a complex uh, number of modulus one. Uh, it is it is enough. Take them. Uh, it is enough because uh, okay, see, the, the argument is the same. Lambda must be necessarily equal to one. It's the only possibility. So you arrive to the same conclusion. Okay. So in fact, this allows you to uh, say that there exists only one. There exists only one, exists a unique G, U, D, by holomorphic, by holomorphic, such that G, zero, taken, take some point uh, here, is zero, for instance, and G prime of zero, of Z zero, is a positive real number. With this uh, hypothesis, there is only one. You, okay, if you have two like this, it must be the same. If you have another one, the value of zero is, is the same. The value of the derivative is in the same half line, so uh, they must be. They must agree. And you can, if you have one, you can modify. You can turn a little bit to uh, reach the, the the condition that the derivative is a positive real number. So. Sometimes it can be useful, of course, to have this uh, conclusion. In fact, this is a little bit more general. If you have any two simply connected, in any two simply connected uh, open subsets different from Z, both of them, there exists only one by holomorphism. This is only one by holomorphism taken. You choose one point here and one point here, random. There is only one that takes some S1 in Z2, and such that the derivative is a positive real number. With this condition, you uh, recover uniqueness. Of course, given any two simply connected open sets, there exists always, different from C, there exists always a biholomorphism. Because you construct biholomorphism from the open sets U1, U2, to D, and you compose two such biholomorphisms. Okay? So this condition allows you to guarantee uniqueness. Uniqueness. And there are some more uh, consequences of the result. Uh, I could state. Uh, in fact, we have constructed a function in the proof of the theorem, in the proof of Riemann's theorem, we have constructed a function such that uh, we have constructed a function such that g prime of z0 is maximum in modulus, is maximum. Uh, 
in fact, this condition allows you to say that g of z0, in fact, must be 0. If this is maximum, the value must be 0, in fact. Why it must be 0? If it's not 0, you could compose by with phi a. And you could consider now this function here. This function takes z0 to 0. OK? And you can take derivatives here. So the derivatives here, phi a uh, prime a times g prime z0. This is 1 If you take a modulus, you obtain that this number here, this is uh, smaller than 1, this number is greater. So it contradicts the uh, fact that the derivative of g at z0 is maximum. So in fact, the hypothesis, the, the, you, we have found a function with maximum value for the derivative at uh, z0, this implies automatically that the value at z0 of this function we have constructed must be 0. Must be 0. If not, we could have uh, found another function with greater value of the derivative. Okay? Some other, well, these are essentially the main properties I would like to uh, state. Um, I'd like to finish with some comments without uh, proofs of uh, what is called the extension to the boundary. So there is a problem that is hard to study. It's not so easy to study. That is the following one. Um, assume, for instance, you have a set U, an open set U, and a simply connected open set, and you have found your bihoromorphism between U and D. OK? So you have your. This by holomorphy is defined in the um, is defined in the interior. So is it possible to extend this this map to extend to the boundary? To extend it to the boundary as a continuous map, for instance? Is it possible? Uh, as a continuous map? Well, the, the, the answer is that in general is not possible. The answer is in general, no. Sometimes yes, you can extend, sometimes not. So what's, what are the main ideas uh, to extend? Mm, first of all, uh, assume you have some... Mm, it is not difficult to show the following fact. Assume you have a sequence here of, of points tending to some point on the boundary. Zn tends to z0, a point on the boundary of u. So this ha they have some image here. OK? So the function fzn does not need to converge, this, this, this sequence does not need to converge. But it's not difficult to show that the modulus of this function tends to 1, in fact. The modulus tends to 1. Why this is true? Uh, OK, this sequence perhaps does not converge, but there is also always a convergent subsequence. OK? A convergent, if, if this subsequence converges to a point here, mm, to a point here, uh, well, we could have, read, uh, we will have a contra you will have a contradiction with some maximal, uh, ma maxim using the uh, maximum modulus uh, theorem, etc. So you could have a contra you would have a contradiction. You have that the function need to be a constant in some. Uh, so it's not going to be possible. So necessarily this limit uh, might be one point in the boundary. So you can make this kind of reason. I don't don't want to be too precise uh, in these statements. But the modulus must always tend to the uh, to one to one. There are very complicated, uh, there are very complicated uh, simply connected open sets. For instance, you can consider 
let's say the unit square, the open unit square. The open unit square, or 0, 1, plus i, i, here, okay? And in this, you uh, remove some segment, open, closed segment here, in the point 1 over 2, in 1 over 3, in 1 over 4, can remove an infinite number of segments here. This is a, a simply connected open set. Okay, this is simply connected. And so there exists a biholomorphism of this set to the unit disk. For instance, uh, let us see that this biholomorphism is, in fact, cannot be extended uh, to some points in the border, in the boundary. Let me uh, recall how was uh, this example here. Mm -mm 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 -mm. Okay, so mm. uh, take for instance, imagine you have some sequence here tending a sequence here tending to a point uh, a sequence in the set tending to a point in the boundary here Zn tending to some Okay and assume you have here a conformal map like this. So the map f of Zn, but the argument I stated before, this map, ma this, this sequence must tend to 1. So we have, must have here some sequence uh, tending, uh, such the modulus, tend to 1. Okay? So take a subsequence, a convergent subsequence. So there is a convergent subsequence of this one that tends to some point here on the boundary. Okay, uh, this point there. And, and you can take uh, the sequence converges here, you can take the segments. So the take f z n is the point a n. Assume that the original sequence, if you want, uh, is such that the images uh, form a sequence converging to a point in the boundary. Here, let's say a point w. Okay, this sequence a n. So take now the segments. So we have some segments here. The counter image of these segments are something very complicated because it's something uh, like this. The counter images of these segments must be, uh, if we have removed all these uh, vertical uh, half lines or segments of these vertical segments, the counter image must be something like this. Okay, so in fact, in the counter image, every point in this segment is a limit point. It can be reached by some. Every point here is a limit point, and this is contradiction with uh, the. If we could extend to the boundary, this would not be possible. Okay, if we could extend this map to the boundary, it would not be possible because here we arrive at this, in fact, this, um, this sequence of segments uh, only has as a limit point this point here. It has not many points, let's say, as a limit point. So it's not possible to extend to the boundary this map. Hmm? Okay, well, of course, this is a um, slightly complicated. Um, uh, Connect, simply connect the open set. And there is a result that is the following one. A point in the, assume you have some open set U and a point in the boundary. This point is going to be simple if for every sequence Zn on U Converging to uh, this point beta, converging to this point beta, there is a curve. There is a curve path uh, gamma in U passing through all these points. So a strictly, a strictly a map, for instance, defined from zero one to U. And a sequence t1 strictly increasing to 1 such that 
Gamma then of Tn is Zn. Okay? So if there is, a, there, is, there is a curve passing through all these points. Uh, this point is going to be called uh, is going to be called mm, simple, but the curve is defined up to one. So the, let's say to you bar uh, gamma one is in gamma one is beta, and the rest is in the interior. Okay, so if you can reach the point passing by all those points, this point this point is going to be simple. So there is a theorem that says that for uh, simple points. The map, the conform, the by holomorphism can be extended. Uh, F u to the by holomorphic, F can be extended continuously. F can be extended continuously to simple points of u r. And this is not easy to show. Uh, this is a result, I think, of Calateodori. And you can find you can find in some books, uh, for instance, in the book of Ash, it devotes a, a chapter to prove this result. It's a more or less simple proof, uh, let's say more more or less elementary, because you don't need too many things. But some things that I have not uh, used here. There is also some proof in the, I think, in the book of Rudin, Real and Complex Analysis. There is also some proof that, if I remember correctly, it uses even some uh, major, major theory, uh, this proof. And also in the book of Cara, there is a good book in two volumes of Cara Teodori of Complex Analysis, where he states some proofs this, this result. But, well, uh, the statement is not so complicated, in fact. So, in the, any biholomorphism can be extended to simple points on the boundary continuously. So, sometimes, for instance, if your um, connected, if your domain, if your simply connected domain is something that is bounded by a simple curve, you have a simple curve, let's say a continuous curve uh, or a, even a C1 curve, and your domain is the inside, the interior of this. this this simple curve here, you can show that in this case, if this is a simple curve, points on the boundary as are simple. In this case, so any biholomorphism to D can be extended to the boundary in this case, continuously. So there is a continuous extension to the boundary. Okay? But you have to show, of course, that. In a point like this, so a regular point, let's say a point that is part of a regular curve, these kind of points are simple. Are simple according to this definition. If you show that, the map can be extended to the boundary. And these are a wide, uh, run, a wide range of, uh, of <laughs> possible open sets. Uh, in fact, most open sets we are using are of this kind. We very rarely use sets of this uh, type. But it's possible, why not, to use. And uh, finally, in order to finish, uh, I uh, remember that we had stated what is a simply connected open uh, set, and we have several equivalences. So we, uh, simply connected means that an open set of C is simply connected either if the complement is connected, either if any function uh, has a primitive, any holomorphic function, any if any if, if any non-zero function has a logarithm. If the integral uh, along any path is zero, any, any loop is zero, for instance, or if it has roots of any order, any function, non zero function has roots of any order. Then using the Riemann's conformal mapping theorem, you can, you can add another equivalent condition. A map is simply connected if and only if, if and only if every, every non zero function has a square root, not only. Roots, not roots of any order, but a square root. Okay? If you have uh, an open set mm, having the, this square root property, it is either C, okay, you know it's simply connected, or is, if it's not C, you know that it's biholomorphically equivalent to the disk. 
So, in particular, using this by holomorphism, as the disk is simply connected and the disk is convex, etc., any function, for instance, defined in your open set U has a primitive uh, using the uh, or has a logarithm, any non zero function. So, any properties you have, you may have, can be applied to this open set. So, it is equivalent to have the, the, the square root property. So, a uh, uh, set having the square property is simply connected and equivalently. Okay? There are some more equivalences uh, to the fact that uh, set, uh, an open set is simply connected. And some of them, perhaps, some other equivalents uh, will appear. But if not, I finish here. And this ends more or less this part about conformal mappings. Conformal mappings, uh, the main results were Montel's theorem and this Riemann conformal mapping theorem. The next uh, lesson we will begin speaking of infinite products, so it's a different topic. Thank you.